Mom? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're Leah. Well, we got to come up this way. We're going to get started, and uh, will you? All right. So we're coming down this way. Uh, we'll just come from there and come down after he introduces us. Why don't you just move? So. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Sea Alaska Heritage is Fall Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us in person as well as live on our YouTube channel. My name is David Russell Jensen. My Shlingit name is Shaka Guk. I serve at Sea Alaska Heritage as our development officer. Very pleased to welcome everyone. Today is one of several free lectures over the next few months. We have the full schedule online at sealaskaheritage.org. At Sea Alaska Heritage, we're committed to providing accessible community programming, but none of it would be possible without the support of donations. You can contribute online at sealaskaheritage.org slash donate or in person via the donation envelopes provided. Today's lecture is titled, How the Chukaniti Clan Earned the Rights to Use the Devilfish or Octopus as a Crest. And today's lecture is presented by Sotka Fred Fulmer. Sotka is a member of the Clinkett tribe, Chukaniti clan of Huna, through his mother, Frances Austin. Fred's interest in carving uh, came from his great grandfather, Frank St. Clair Sr. Fred started learning carving in the 90s from his Chukaniti uncle, Ray Nielsen Sr. Over the span of 28 years, Fred's journey as an artist has been a culmination of listening to stories from his aunts and uncles working alongside other carvers and receiving inspiration through dreams and visions as he pursues his passion. His latest creation is a, his rendition of how the Chukunidi clan earned the rights to use the devilfish or octopus as a crest. And it has a large monumental mask carved from old growth red cedar. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. If you're on the live stream, you can type your questions in the chat or we have a mic provided uh, here in person. Before we commence the lecture, I'd like to ask Rosita Whirl to come up and explain clan crests. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we're very, very excited to have Fred uh, here with us and with his family. Um, but what I thought I would do is just give you a brief uh, overview of what crests are. Crests are probably are the most valuable and sacred things that a clan can own. And I want everybody to know crests are owned by clans. They are the property, real property of clans. And clans felt so strongly about their crests that if anyone should use it for, that didn't have a right to use it, it would result in, in confrontation sometimes wars among our people. So crests are really important to us. But what, how did we get crests? What's the meaning of crests? Well, crests come from a supernatural event, an event when a human met a supernatural being. That supernatural being could be an animal, a fish, or a bird. In our culture, we believe that all animals, all beings have spirits. They have spirits. So when we have this supernatural encounter, sometimes there, it results in the death of the human being. And so that is a payment, you know, for being able to use that a depiction of that event. That person has paid for it for his clan, his or her clan, to be able to make a visual representation of the event. And I want to tell you that when we first make the visual representation, this is when we just call it art, atnane. And this is something new that we recently found out. We had thought that there was no word for art in, in, our, in our culture. But we have a council of traditional scholars. And when the, our chair, Kenny Grant, said the word atnane, uh, we, all of our meetings are in Clinket, and then we have translators. And the translator asked Kenny, we, he stopped the meeting, and he said, what does atnane mean? And he responded, 
it refers to an iconic event. That's that supernatural encounter. So when we make it into a visual representation, it's art. But then we take that visual representation and it's put on an object. Uh, it could be a clan hat, it could be a paddle, it could be a screen. But when we put that visual representation on an, an object, it is then brought out in a ceremony. And then we have the opposite side. In our, in our culture, we were divided in half, eagles and ravens. So when the Chukunadi brought out their octopus, the opposite side was there. And they witnessed that. And in that public presentation, the object is ceremoniously transferred, transformed into a sacred object that is owned by the clan. That process of bringing it out ceremoniously and then having the opposite side witness it uh, transforms it into at u, a sacred clan object. So the object is owned by the clan. The names of the individuals who are involved in the event becomes clan property. The songs that were developed around that event become clan property. Songs, stories, names, and then the land wherever that event occurred all become at u and owned by the clan. So it's a complex, it's a complex uh, process and a complex uh, thing to understand. But when we have, you know, these things brought out, you know, to us, it's a gift that we can be able to see Clan at U. And in celebration, you'll see all of our, many, many of our clans bringing out their sacred at U. So I just wanted to give you a, an overview, a brief introduction to the significance of, of Cress. And I just want to add one other note is that Cress, the same Cress, the design, be owned by multiple clans because each clan might have a different story, a different story about the encounter that they had with the same animal. So uh, we know like for example that the Devil's Club is owned by multiple clans just as many other crests are owned by multiple clans. Sometimes we uh, split, our clans split off or when they become too big or they move and migrate to another area and they still have the right to use the same crest of their clan. So I just wanted you know, to provide that introduction. And now we'll let Fred finish our presentation. Ah, we'll go down. attention. Thank you all for coming, respectful people. Thank you, ancestors. Forgive me if I don't speak our language correctly. 
on Yakusani. Thank you, respectful people of this land, for letting us be here. Una shish, see Alaska Heritage, Rosita World, for inviting me to be here. Satka Yuhat, Eduasauk. My shlinket name is Satka. Clay Ka, Kenak, Fred Fomer, Eduasauk. My English name is Fred Fomer. Chukunedi, Nahatsati. Kuna Kawu Ayahat, Sit Iti Gai Kwan. I'm from the Chukunedi clan. My family's from Huna, and Glacier Bay is our ancestor homeland. Oh, let me figure this one out. A little smarter than me sometimes. Okay, anyways, this is my mom, Frances Austin. My mom was born here in Juneau and raised in Huna. Her parents were James Austin Sr. and Josie St. Clair. This is up in Glacier Bay area, Marble Island. I'm sorry. Recently, I finished carving a large totem pole sized mask that represents a story of how the Chukunadi earned the rights to use the devilfish octopus as one of our clan's symbols. Now before I get into that and tell that story, I want to take you on a journey. I want to tell you about my journey of, of learning to carve. Back in the 80s, my wife and I, Ivy, we, moved, we took our family, two children at the time, moved to Ketchikan, Alaska. Ketchikan was rich in culture. Clinkett, Haida, Simshian. There's totem poles everywhere from Saxman over all the way out to um, totem, bite. totem Bite and everywhere in between. We witnessed totem poles being raised. We attended cultural events. Our oldest daughter, Yolanda, danced with the Kitchon dancers. That was led by Esther Shea and Lorena John. And I was attending, learning, studying diesel mechanics. And in that building where the mechan diesel, diesel lab was, Nathan Jackson was there carving two totem poles for Sea Alaska, an eagle one and a raven one. And I would go over there and I would watch Nathan carve. And I'd go and I'd try to strike up a conversation with him from time to time. And Nathan, all he would do would be was he would just grunt. And so, okay, he's got work to do. One in December, when having a, a break from uh, school, I went to Huna to go hunting. And on the way back, I seen Nathan getting on the ferry. And he looked at me and asked me, he goes, well, what are you doing here? I said, my mom's from here, and I'm, I'm up here hunting. What are you doing here? And he goes, well, I'm up here visiting a friend, and I'm hunting as well. And so he asked me who my family was. And so I told him. And he said, Frank Sinclair Sr. is a relative of mine. And then we spent the next three or four hours just talking and getting to know each other and enjoying each other's company. But when I had found out that my great-grandfather, Frank Sinclair Sr., had carved the totem pole in, for the Occoquan people, that, that's the totem pole that really inspired me, that gave me the desire to want to learn how to carve. I wanted to... I wanted to... Can I sheesh? I wanted to experience the same things he did through carving, because I didn't get to know who he was. And so I was going to talk to Nathan, see if he would help him teach me. But my mom was having health issues and complications. So my wife, Ivy, and I, we had our four children at the time, so we moved back down to Washington State. And there I learned that there was a Clinkett man teaching carving over at Edmonds, Senior Citizen Center. So I got a hold of him. And he ended up being a clan uncle, Ray Nielsen Sr. He's from the Chukane clan, Iceberg house, house, just like myself. So I started going over and, and carving over there. And we learned how to make knives, and then we got a board and started practicing carving V grooves, crescents, ovoids, uh, trigons. And so I, I was getting pretty comfortable with doing that. So I wanted to carve something else. And so I grabbed, got a piece of, firewood from a neighbor, 
And I drew this raven on there and a little mountain scenery and little birds. And so I was pretty proud of that. And so that's my very first carving. Well, our artist daughter, Yolanda, her friend came over and she was looking at the, what I had there. And she goes, that looks like a toucan. <laughs> and I go, that's not a toucan, it's a raven. But then I looked, but then I looked at the toucan and it has this big, huge, wide beak and everything. And then I went back and I looked at the, the bird that I was carving, and sure enough, she was right. It looked like a toucan. <laughs> and so I started to narrow it down and try to make it look more like a, a, a raven. But this is how this piece sits in our house today. Well, Ray ended up getting some um, cedar, cedar wood, and so we could get to the part of starting to learn how to carve. And so these are his designs. Now it started with the, the totem pole on the left, the wolf. And so we prepped the wood, got the design on there and started carving. And I remember like yesterday, it was real scary going down into that wood and, and to make the design popped out. It was overwhelming and it was just like, oh man, I'm worried about that, you're gonna, you're gonna break it and ruin it and, or cut yourself or any of the above. So, but I remember those feelings of being, that it was scary and, and, and those feelings are real. And so, as you can see, I made it through okay. And then the design on the right, the tone on the right, we started carving that one. That's the Gona Cadet Sea Monster Pole. Ray, Ray referred to this pole as the Wicked Mother-in-Law Pole. <laughs> and so, but it's the Gona Cadet story. Well, I carved with Ray, was going over there and learning carving from him for a little bit over a year. And, um, Then he passed away. It was hard for the Chuka native people, or the family, his family. And I was very grateful that our family got to know Ray's family. I was very grateful that I got to spend the time that he helped set me on the path of learning how to carve. Well, I heard of a, that there was this um, Alaskan carver that was down in, uh, um, Redmond, Washington, teaching carving down there at a, a place called the Slough House. So I went down there, found the Slough House, went over and talked to this, this gentleman, the carver. His name was Ralph Bennett, he was a Haida carver. So I told him what I wanted to do and got signed up on their Saturday classes that he had. And I spent a few years carving with Ralph. We'd carve totem poles, masks, paddles, regalia. for the family and dance group. Well, my mom's cousin, one of her cousins, harvested a yellow cedar tree out of Huna and shipped it down to, uh, to where I lived. He was coming over to our, our place and we started to, to uh, uh, prep the log for uh, tonal pole. And he asked me, what is it that you want to carve? And I thought about it and I said, well, I want to carve something that represents my mom. So the eagle's on the top and the brown bears on the bottom, and then we discussed what, we, to, what uh, to fill in the rest of the spaces with, and then we, we figured that the killer whale is all around Puget Sound waters, come all the way up through Alaska. So we put the killer whale on there. Well, as life goes on, we went our different, different ways, and Ivy and I, we moved to uh, Carnation, and she asked me, can you finish carving that totem pole by your birthday? I said, yeah. Well, that birthday happened to be my 50th birthday, and so I said, sure. So I went up to the Snoqualmie tribe, talked to them, and let them know who I was, where I was living, and wanted to get the permission. I said, well, I'm carving this tone pole, and when it's done, I want to get their permission to raise it on their land. And they said, they, yeah, for sure. And so I invited them to be a part of that. And so they did come down. One of their chiefs came down, their, their uh, uh, people, members from the tribe. Our dance group was over there, members of uh, uh, the Alaskan community, our family and friends came over. So. The totem pole on the left is where we're at in, in Carnation. And then Ivy and I moved up to, uh, to Juneau in 2013, and I loaned that totem pole out to the Boy Scout camp up outside of Monroe. And then we moved back down to uh, Washington in 2018. I went and grabbed the totem pole, brought it home, cleaned it up, spruced it up, gave it a facelift, put a new paint job on there. I gave it to my brother, and we raised the totem pole up at his, up at his house. 
He lives out by the Canadian border in eastern Washington. This is called a traveling pole. But there's a lot of awesome things that happen with that. And that's for another story for another day. Right, girls? Right? Yeah. I always said to go wink, wink. <laughs> Well, during that time while I was in Washington, I, I hooked up with a, a guy named uh, Nathan Gillis. And so he was carving on this pole, and he said, hey, why don't you come on over and, and work with me on this pole? It would be great. We could get together, and we could sh share ideas and, of how to carve a pole. And I chuckled, and I laughed, and I said, well, I'll come over there, but I don't think it's going to be an even exchange. I think it's going to be more of me learning from you. And the reason why I show this picture here is because um, Nathan likes leveling out his, uh, the tonal pole from side to side. And, and he uses big dividers, like a lot of artists do, to measure points to transfer points from one side to the other. But he also uses this laser light, uh, a vertical horizontal level. And then he will go over, and let's say like, he'll see if I can figure out how this pointer is. So let's say he's measuring from here, somewhere down in here. And he measures, and it's three inches, and he goes over the same point on the other side, and it's two and a half inches, so you know you gotta go down a half inch. So that method that I learned from him, I use that method today. Then at the same time around there in Washington, I got to know a guy named Scott Jensen. And he invited me to come over to his place, and, and he, was, uh, he specializes in uh, clinket style carving. And so I'd go over to his place, and him and I would work, he showed me how to um, carve masks, and, uh, frontlet. Um, I got to, I attended a lot of the workshops that he had there. Well, in 2004, my mom passed away. So my Uncle Ken came over from Hawaii for the, uh, the funeral services. Well, during that time, I talked with Lily White, my auntie, and she asked me, she goes, Freddie, do you carve? And I said, yes, I do. Then she didn't ask me if I would consider, if I would be interested, or if I want to. She came right out and said, Sonny boy, you need to carve our pole and bring it back home. And so I, when I got off the phone with her, I called my uncle right away and I said, Uncle, I just got off the phone with Auntie Lily and this is what she said. And when I told him that, he goes, you know what you got to do then. And so I kept that in the back of my mind. It would wait on me to, uh, the, to be able to, to do that. I shared that story with Scott Jensen at the time and told him about the Coons pole. And 10 years later in 2014, I'm, Ivy and I were living up in Juneau. I was over in Huna doing some carving over there, waiting for my Coast Guard credentials to go work on the Alaska Marine Highway. Jeff was talking to Scott, and he, he, told, him, he told him about what Lily had talked to all of us uh, true Canadian carvers about. And Scott said, I heard that story before. I heard that somewhere from Fred. And so Scott, Jeff, and myself, we started collaborating and talking about that. Scott said he had a log that he'll donate. He'll donate his time for carving, to the place to, to carve it. And so I called up Uncle Ken, and I shared this with him. and told him, this is what we want to do. And he says, OK, that's great. He goes, get a hold of our clan leader, George Martin. Take him out for some coffee or breakfast and tell, share with him just what you shared with me. Get his approval for that. So Jeff and I took uh, George Martin out to breakfast over at Mary's Inn over there. To share to talk to him, and he, he liked it, and he said, yeah, go right ahead. Then we put a proposal together, went over to the city of Huna, got their, got their proposal. Uh, Bob Starbard with uh, HIA, he, put it, he helped out with facilitating and, and getting this up. So anyways, then, then Jeff and I, we took a few months off of, of work, went down to Bellingham. We, got, we had a, um, a, Lummi, a Lummi medicine man came over and blessed the, blessed the log. And then we started prepping the log and fastening it, hollowing out, getting the design. Uh, Scott helped out uh, with the design that Lily White had, had sent to me. And then we started carving them. Well, a few months later, you know, uh, Jeff and I had to go back, come back up to Alaska, and we had to go back to work. And so Scott finished uh, the carving of it and sent it up. And in 2016, here you see it in the creek where it stands today. It was a good project to be a part of. Oh, yeah. Now, when I was, I spent four months um, with Alaska Marine Highway down in Ketchikan in the yard, and using, you know, like uh, what the Marine Highway does is during the wintertime, 
the majority of the fleet goes down to Ketchikan Shipyard, and that's where they do all the heavy maintenance that's required to, on the boats. And so when I was leaving there and coming back up, I texted my, my nephew. I said, hey, nephew, I'm heading back up to Juneau. And he said, um, he goes, are you aware that Wayne Price is restoring Grandpa's pole? And I said, no, I'm not. So he, he texted me the link. And when I got back into Juneau, took a look at it, was over at the Forest Service Center, was lit, which was literally just a couple minutes away from where I, Ivy and I lived. So I went over there, talked to Wayne Price, got to work with him on that. I got to, um, he's to approve to, to go over and help him out with that. Well, the, this totem pole, this is the one, whoops, wrong one. This is the one that got me interested, the, the desire to um, carve. And when I would write my artist, um, what do you call that, statement, I always put in there that if the totem pole that my great-grandfather carved needed to be restored or replaced, I would like to be a part of that. So here I am, I spent four months down in Ketchikan, I'm coming home, they're giving me a month off. And so Wayne Price was doing the restoration and preservation work on this, this totem pole, and it took us a whole month. We spent long hours and we got that totem pole done in, in that month. So what are the chances? What are the odds that I got off of work for one month and Wayne Price was doing the restoration work on this? I don't think it was a coincidence. And now this totem pole, I didn't even know where it was because five years or so prior to that, it was taken down and I didn't know because when I would, we'd come up to Juneau, we'd always go out there to look for it and it was gone. Had no you know, idea where it went. Well, when my, when my mom was alive, we would come to, when we'd come to Juneau for a celebration, we'd always go out to Ock Bay and Ock Wreck and then we'd go over there and we would clean up all the garbage, pull all the weeds and spruce it all up to her satisfaction, we knew that every time we came to Juno, that's what we we're going to do because that was a way that we showed respect to my mom's grandfather. Well, while I was over here, we're doing some work on this. Um, we had our granddaughter, granddaughters, our great granddaughters, our, well, it was just one great granddaughter at the time, our, our, our children coming over and helping doing some um, painting and helping work on, on, on this totem pole. And so we counted down. It was seven generations from Frank Sinclair Sr. And that was awesome. And then Rilia's mom, Jordan's mom, Yolanda, had spent a lot of time helping work on that totem pole. So that was, that was a great project. And you can see here that it's, um, Standing up there, it looks like it's leaning. I say, well, it looks like the Leaning Tower of Pizza kind of in a way. But anyways, that, that's it there. All right. Now, when I was down in, in uh, Ketchikan for those four months, I called up uh, Nathan Jackson. And because I wanted to go check out and see the uh, Saxman carving shed. And so Nathan answers the phone. He goes, who's this? And I said, well, this is from Fulmer. I said, you may not remember me. He goes, well, where are you, where are you from? And I said, well, my, my family's from Huna. My mom's grandfather is the one that carved the, the totem pole out for the Akwan people, the Yakti pole. And he said, Frank Sinclair Sr. is a relative of mine. What is it that you want to do? I said, I want to come out and check out the, your, um, your carving shed there in Saxman. He said, I'll be over there in 15 minutes. And so he did, he came out. And so the, over the next four months of my time off, I spent a lot of time going over to with um, Nathan and I had a clan hat that, what, that I was carving. I was working on that. I'd, I helped do some ad zine on, on some of his projects, clean up his shop. And we'd go out to Mama Diaz and have breakfast. And so that, that, I spent a lot of time with him doing that. And when, he, when we were there, he said, I might be doing, getting a project, uh, a tone pole project up in Juneau. And if that comes through, I want you to be one of um, the artists. And I said, okay. So when I got back up in, uh, to Juneau, the, uh, Go Belt was sending out a, a call for artists. And so that was the, the uh, project that um, Nathan was referring to. So I ended up sending, submitting um, a packet and then went through the interview process and was, ended up being selected as one of the carvers. Mick was the lead carver. Rick, B, Rick was, uh, came on and he was carving some of the key, key faces on, on the pole. I was the mentor carver. And then Herb Shakley Jr., Elijah Marks, and Jeffrey Osiris, Jeffrey Osiris they, were, they were the uh, um, apprentices. And then Samuel 
Shakley came over and he spent a lot of time helping out there as well. And then we had, after we had the, the totem raising, which was awesome. This is over at Gaston Elementary on Douglas Island. Um, Mick would stand back and he's looking at it and he goes, it reads well. And I'm going, yes it does. And so I got to know some other uh, Juno carvers um, while living here in Juno as well. So Chuck Smythe was doing this uh, curriculum, uh, putting together a curriculum on, on carving these uh, halibut hooks and how to fish them. And I got to be one of the carvers on there. Well, one of the local artists, Donald Gregory, stand up and take a bow, Donald, raise your hand. There he is, look at that, right there. <laughs> Donald Gregory, at this point, he probably had like 50 halibut hooks that he had carved. And so he was great at facilitating that whole workshop. It was awesome, it was, it was good to be a part of. So the, the halibut hooks on the right, those are the ones that I had made. All right, busy picture, right? So this hat, cedar hat, I learned how to start carving that when I was working with Wayne Price on my great-grandfather's pole. He wanted to, he goes, hey, you want to learn how to make a hat? And I go, yeah, sure. So then that's what we started. And then there's design. I learned how to, to uh, uh, make a design for that because you have a compound radius there and Scott Jensen to help, help me out with that. Now, there's another local artist that I got to get to know and, and hung out with at times and, and that was uh, Ray Watkins. Let me go back. So Ray Watkins, um, he was putting together a lot of these, uh, um, he got a bunch of auto wood and he started to, to put together uh, some carving blanks for that. And so this little ego on the right, he, he asked me if I wanted to learn how to make that because him and I had talked about it and I said, hey, I want to learn how, how you approach carving and because uh, mine's not the only way. And so he was showing me how, how to do that. And then I asked him, hey, do you have a bigger block of wood or a bigger piece of wood? Because I want to make a, a, another eagle. And he said, sure, go right ahead. And so this is the one there. And so I had like six weeks off between work, between jobs. And I was, I was carving, demonstration carving, just right outside this building here in this little alcove area. And uh, the tourists are coming by. And so I was out there. And, and um, Don, Donald would come out there once in a while and check out and see what's going on, say hi. And he said, you know, from this angle here, that looks, that looks like an octopus beak. And I looked down and go, you're right. So my eagle turned into an octopus. <laughs> so while I was over here carving here, um, the Sea Alaska Heritage was doing a mask exhibit. And that was directly behind the wall from where I was sitting. And so they brought up all these masks from out of the archives in the basement, brought them up and put them on display. So I wanted to come in and check that out. And so as I came in and was looking at it, I came around one of the corners there and they had this big glass cabinet with all these masks in there. And this, there's this one that was on the right. I looked at that and man, that, that just pulled me in. And I was just, so I went right on up to it and I studied that. It was a beautiful mask. It was about the size of a, a real large grapefruit. And it was a shaman mask and it was carved in the 1800s. And it was from Yakutat. And I studied that and I studied the years on that. And I decided that the next mask I make is going to have ears on it. And so this one here, that's the mask there. Now on this other uh, picture here, this is a, a totem, a little totem, model totem pole that I'd been working on and carving for a number of years. I, I just work on it, pick it up from time to time. If, in the next slide, I'll you know, talk about that one. Then back here is a uh, devil fish, octopus mask that I was carving. This is a, a moon mask that I made to put in the Sorrentin Gallery. And so my, my daughter-in-law, um, Jessica Fulmer and, and our son, they went over and bought that and, picked, and it hangs on the wall. So I get to go visit from time to time. So let's get on to the next slide. All right. So that little model totem pole that was over on the table over here, that's the main figure right here. I call this project the ancient ones and it's the ancestors pole. Well, in 2018, Ivy and I had moved back down to uh, Washington, um, Washington, and 
I wanted to carve a tone pole by myself because I had already, you know, over the years had carved with other people. So I talked to Dwayne Pascal. I said, hey, Dwayne, I want to carve a, a totem. And so um, he goes, so what is it that you want to do? And I told him. And then he said, well, I said, do you know where I can get a log? And he said, sure, I got two of them. Come on over. Pick the one you like, and if you like the price, it's yours. And so obviously, well, it must have been a good deal, right? And so. Like I was saying, that it was a totem pole that I wanted to carve that only I carved, and I, and I did that. But I ended up getting some help along the way. Yeah, right? Is Jordan Fulmer in the house? <laughs> Raise your hand. Jordan, stand up and take a bow. Wow, I didn't think she would do that. Yeah. Well, when it got to the point where we're painting this, Jordan came down to our place for like 68, 69 days, and she spent a lot of time painting on, on this totem pole. Our other granddaughters down in, in Washington, uh, me and Charity, helped out with painting. Our grandsons, Duncan and Jamie, came over and helped paint. Our, our son, um, Ivy, helped paint. Our son, Fred, uh, did a little painting. And then he also um, helped me and lay uh, the 140 uh, operculum shells on there. So it got to be a family event. And so there, there are some great stories that, that are surrounding that one, this pole, but those stories are to be saved for another day. Right, girls? So, and this time Ivy can wink. <laughs> All right. All right, so here's the, the octopus mask, the Chukunadi mask. When I was carving that mask, I was thinking about, I wanted to carve a mask that represented my mom, because I always think about my mom. Chukunadi, I went in to represent the siblings, the siblings in our clan. And so that's the finished piece there. It's over at our granddaughter's place, um, at the, uh, on the mantle, obviously. So here's Ivy and I, and we're with our granddaughters, Charity, Mia, and Signe. And so that's where that, that sits at now, so I get to go visit it once in a while. <laughs> well, I mean the granddaughters. <laughs> <laughs> So then we had some wood delivered. And just to show you how that was happening. And then I grabbed and I tied a rope around one of these blocks. And it was like over 400 pounds. And so I'm going, there's got to be an easier way. Because I wrapped the, that rope around there. And I was literally dragging that inch by inch. Because you know what? Every once in a while, I find myself that I have a tendency sometimes it's just to Neanderthal my way through things. And so there's a, there's a classic example. <laughs> So we got the, the block, uh, the, the cedar all up on its blocks and it's all leveled out. I've got the, the, the mask that I'm using for the prototype. With this mask here, I was only able to put, because uh, it's, it's a low profile, so I was only able to get four tentacles on there. With this block wood, I'm gonna be able to get all eight of them on there. The thing that I like about this as well, just be, besides being able to carve this, I'm being able to carve it, this uh, clan, the Chukunadi mask, while I'm next to the ancestor's pole, being able to do that. And then this, the ancestor's pole here was like, oh, about 94, 95% complete. But to be able to, that energy and that, that feeling and the spiritualness of being able to be there next to each other and carving that it was awesome. So, ready, set, go. Got the design transferred on there. So you can see that the clink of calls face, forgot I had a pointer. It looks quite a bit like the, the one that, I, the smaller one there. Here's another picture of the, the, the block of wood leveled out. That's a four foot long level right there. Doing some fascinating work, doing some more uh, carving on, on that. I wanted to show this one because this is one of Steve Brown's adzes. I went over to Steve Brown's and I, I, I made a few more adzes with him and, and some blades, uh, carving blades. They work great, love them. And now, this picture, I'm gonna show that when Ivy and I first started talking, we, we were talking about ideas and, and sharing ideas on, on carbon this. And so, Ivy wanted to have these tentacles, doing all this swirling and twisting, doing all this stuff, and I go, man, that sounds like an awesome idea. But I don't have any room, because I'm pretty much committed to the space to the shouldn't get caused face. And so I was pretty well okay with, well, I'm gonna go ahead and do like smaller mask and bring the 
all eight tentacles like the hair all the way down here. That meant I was gonna have to cut out this big chunk of wood right here. And when I look at that, I'm going, that's a lot of real estate to get rid of. And I had the chainsaw out and I was this close to committing it to that, but I decided, no, I'm not going to. I was working my way down carving and I always think about it. I, um, I get inspired um, from conversation with uh, uh, my wife and family. I get inspired from dreams. I get visions at times. So I thought, no, I'm just gonna wait and see what, what, uh, what uh, in inspiration I get. And so decided when I got down this way that we're gonna start looping these um, tentacles. And there's one down along the side that you can't see here. And this is a show that I do use at laser light level. Now, I got the tentacles carved out and you can see these negative spaces as light shining through here. And this is the same one with the uh, nighttime. I love taking pictures and carving all hours of the day and night. And I also love playing with lighting. And the other thing I like doing is, is three faces. There's one on the apron, this is a mountain face and then the oct octopus face. And so, and you can see the operculum starting to get laid on there. The ancestors fall well. Ivy would look out the back window and here she is. Um, she's uh, she got a picture of me working on the devilfish mask next to the ancestors pole. Here's nighttime, <laughs> still carving away and you can see the little prototype mask I have right there to looking at from time to time. So now I got to match up the left side. And so here it is. And so with this picture, I, like I said, I, I enjoy being able to carve more than one project next to each other's. And this one here being able to, again, be next to the ancestors pole. And I love the, three, the, the theme of three faces there, if I can get that in a picture. Well, it's some, you know, like, like the nature of woods, some of it gets damaged. So you can see here, I'm starting to do some uh, repair work on it. Um, I'm, I had to replace the sucker on this one so you can see the repair work on that. Now, with the, with the tentacles here, you see all this carved out space, that's a negative space. And so these circles here that I decided to make faces, I was gonna cut those out of there and then it'll be like the negative space here and it would have been like the, the tentacles would have been freestanding like that. And that would have looked awesome too. But then I thought, no, I'm going to go ahead, I'm gonna carve faces in there. And so these faces, and it being spirit faces that represents the lives that were claimed by the devil fish. At this point right here is when this mass went from being an octopus mass, it went from that, this is where it ended up being the Kalkooch story. So Ivy said she wanted to help carve. And so I said, okay, we got all these suckers here that we gotta carve them and get them concave and so, here she is wearing her Michael Jackson glove <laughs> and, and carving away. And, and so this is one of the suckers that she had carved and she goes, I love curls. And then what do you say after that? And then he gets to clean up my mess. And then she, yeah, so I love curls too. All right, did I miss one here? Let me see. Nope. So the uh, um, Burke Museum invited me down there to, to do some demonstration carving. And this, this is Ashley. She's one of the employees down there at the, at the Burke. And she was one that helped facilitate me being able to be down there and, and, and to be showing the mask and telling the story and doing some carving. This is a picture of me and Ivy with our web designer, Kingsley. And this is a cool, awesome picture right here. This mother and daughter came in there, then they were looking at the mask. This, this little girl just kept going up there reaching and touching the tentacles and the suckers and stuff. She was really enjoying herself. And that was awesome. And thank you, Burke Museum. So Ivy takes pictures from out, out the back window at times. Yeah, here I, I do uh, touch up my tools from time to time. This is a picture I had a, a tool made so I could measure the, the thickness of, of the mask. And there's this guy standing in the back and his name is Chris Cashman. He's with uh, King 5 News, so he was coming over to do a story on, 
interviewing me for the uh, King 5 News, in case you're wondering who is that person standing back there. And yes, you do have to flip the mask over and, and lighten it up and hollow out the backside. So there's a picture of that happening. So my wife always says, every time I carve a mask, she goes, boy, it looks like you're carving, it's making a self-portrait. So she took these pictures and I'm going, yeah, I guess you're right, self-portrait, you know? And so, but I like this one, this black and white type picture right here in the middle, but that's cool. Here Ivy and I are holding up the mask because right now at this time, it won't stand up on its own because this is all getting carved away. So there's people that come over and come by to visit, do interviews, and so she's helping me hold it up for that. So my son was over and he's carving and we decided to take a, a little break and a little Kodak moment. And so I was teasing my son. I said, you know what? This is more of a self-portrait of your face. And so he starts chuckling. Fred Jr. Fred Jr., yeah. Time to paint. So all the faces there were, they're, they're all carved and ready to go. On the left here, again, the black and the red going on here. And one of the things I like to show on, about on this picture is there's another large mass plank right here that's getting prepped and faceted. Over here is uh, the, the ancestors totem pole. And then I have another log that I got from Dwayne Pascal on the other side of that waiting for a design. And then here it is with the, the, the paint is all, all finished now. And I like three pictures and I like making collages. So here it is, left, right, and in the center. So here I am standing with it, it's finished and it's hanging on our wall at home right now. But I wanted to show this picture because look at the size of my face versus compared to Kakucha's face. So this gives you an idea of how, how big um, this mask is. Now one of the things that I wanted to share with you before I start getting into telling the, um, our clan story, I was talking with my Uncle Ken one time and he was telling me, well, now if, if those of you that don't know my Uncle Ken, he was raised up to train to be a, a Chukunadi clan leader. He spoke fluent Shringet. In his latter years, he took a, um, got a degree in library science and did some uh, anthropology work here and there. Well, he was telling me that he was going up and down Southeast Alaska and he was interviewing old timers. And these interviews that he was conducting was done in uh, Shringet. And then he'd go back to his office and translate them into English. Well, he was telling me that he was talking to this one old timer. And he says to him, I've heard a few different versions of one of your clan stories. Which one is correct? You got any ideas? <laughs> the old man sat there and thought about it for a minute, and then he said, they're all correct, because we're an oral language and an oral history. And the, the versions that they heard came down from their great-grandparents, grandparents, and aunts and uncles. And they're all correct. And my uncle told me, he goes, I learned something that day. So with that being said, the Chukunedi story, the version that I'm gonna tell is, a, is one that I know, that I've heard. But there, through, within the clan, there are other different versions. But like you know, Rosita had mentioned and talked about, and what my uncle was talking about, different versions, they're all correct. So the version that I'm telling, gonna share with you today is not the only version, it's just one that I'm gonna share with you. So there's a time when humans and animals understood the, each other's language. And there was this big devil fish that was living in the waters over in Indian Islands. And it was taking the lives of people as they're going up there. They're swamping, swamping the canoes and boats and, and killing the, the occupants there. And this was going on, it was, it was, it was a big problem. And the Chukunadi warriors were going after it. And the devil fish was wiping them out too. Well, Kaw Cooch was sitting down talking to his brother-in-law, and he was, he was worried, he's going, he's the only, he was a, the last Chukunadi warrior alive there, and he's going, how do I kill this? I don't know, it just, just it, it was just weighing on him. And so the porpoise people were listening, and they came up to him and said, we have a solution, we know how you can kill the porpoise, but you have to make a pact with us. Okay, so, and, what happened was is he told him that when you guys went and go out to battle, you're, you're fighting the, the devil fish where the, the devil fish has the um, advantage. 
And then it's knocking the, the spears and the, and the daggers out of your hand. So you need to find a place, a location where you have the advantage. And we will sacrifice our people to help you out. And so they did. Him and his brother, they found a place over in Indian Islands where it was to their advantage. And at low tide, and the porpoise people sacrificed themselves and blood filled the waters all around them and started attracting the, uh, the devil fish. Well, Kaakuch seen that that was happening and the devil fish was coming. So he had two clinket daggers and he started to strap them to his hands. And as he was doing that, he was going, hoo, hoo. I hope I didn't scare you, my young great grandson. And, and he was preparing for battle. And then he dove into the water after the devil fish and the waters were boiling and churning. And then he went flat calm and called Kuchta in the surface. And so his brother-in-law realized that and noticed that. So he went back to tell the people that of what happened. And a few days later, the devil fish washed up on shore. And when they went to go investigate, they noticed that there was a man wrapped up in, in, in the tentacles. And when, and when they're uncovering that, they thought it was a two, oh, they thought it was a black man. But then they found out it was Kakuch. During the battle, Kakuch had cut up through the ink sack and got all that ink all over him. And he did manage to kill the devil fish, but in turn, the devil fish had killed him. And so, to this day, the, the Chukunadi people, we claim the octopus, the devil fish, as one of our clan symbols from that, that historical event that happened in Indian Islands. We don't claim anybody else's stories. Our aunties and, and uncles, the elders, the old timers, they talked about other clans and other tribes that had the, the devil fish as their symbol. But this is our story. This is our history. Indian Island, this is ours. It's our ot ooh. And so, and even all the way down here, down into Washington and all around the world, you have dealings with the octopus. When I'm down in Washington, I, I joke around with him. I say, you know what? This mask represents Pacific Northwest Native people. This is one of our Kraken stories. And they start laughing because they understand whether there's a, a hockey team down there that's called the Krakens. And so, let me see, is there anything else? Oh yeah, yeah, I do. Um, Down here on the, on the spirit faces, I, I put the operculum shells here to represent the young, the, the women and the children, the female, that were, the lives that were claimed by this devil fish. Yes. Oh, uh-huh. You're welcome, thank you. I appreciate this, you know, because it's um, to be able to come here and uh, share our story. And it was an honor for me to be able to, to carve this and, and to represent um, the, my aunties, uncles, grandparents, all of them, the, the Chukunidi clan. This is us. And so it's been an honor to be able to, to do that. And I'm very thankful for Rosita to be able to invite us up here. What, how much time do we have? Um, is, is it full tide yet or is the tide still out? <laughs> Huh? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Well, let me see. Well, we can do question and answer, but I do have a, a minute and 30 second video of this, the, the um, devil fish mask. Do you want to see that? Yeah. Because if not, we can go right into <laughs> question and answer. But if you want to see that, I'll go ahead and play it. So can you help out with that? Uh, let me see. I think it, it's, it should be on here. I should be able to scroll down to the next one over, actually. Good morning. Saka, coming from my place to your place. You can see that. I know I don't talk that soft. <laughs> she can vouch for that. Uh, How many years? 47? Behind me, true Canadian story. I'll turn this thing around. And as we come around, I'll take a look at it. All right, let's see if I can get this to, sometimes I have to zoom in before I can zoom out. Okay, 
So here we are, taking a look at the mask, and it's four foot tall. So what do you have, an eight foot ceiling or something like that? So anyways, this is called Klooch. This is the devil fish that he fought. These are the spirit faces of the lives that were claimed by um, the devil fish. These are perculum shells here, or labrets, represent labret, the, the, the female. Nose ring, Samuel Shakely, a Chukunady brother, made those for me. So I appreciate that. So this is a Chukunady story, clan story. And happy to finally get it done and to be able to put it up on the wall. So, yeah, looking good, having a great day. Yeah, so I'm just kind of step back and yeah, it feels good to be able to see it up on the wall. All right. Yay, Quasatine Satsu. I'll see you later. Uh huh. So it, it'll just stay like that, right? All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. So if there's any questions, which I can't imagine that there would be one or two, um, if there are any questions, that'd be great. I'm more than happy to answer it. We also want to dance the Ahuna exit when we uh, end our. Our presentation here, the Huna accent. My my uncle told me that this is the changing tides, and that's what that song's about. And so we'll when we do exit, we'll go up and dance around and head out that direction, I guess. And so, but is there anybody that has any questions here? That's awesome. How do I know awesome. the story is true? <laughs> How do I know the story is true? That, that's what our granddaughter asked. Him. Yeah. Well, I know when our granddaughters asked us about that because she's, she's young, you know. Yeah. And I told her, I said, well, how does anybody know that the Jesus Christ story is true or the flood is true or any of those things? But this is our old history that was passed down to us through our grandparents, great-grandparents, and clan people. And so this is our history. And so um, I think I have a tendency that I will believe them. There aren't any on the live stream, but there's lots of positive comments. So people are really appreciative. Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe I'll take a seat here. <laughs> oh, yes. I don't, I think it might be out of tune a little bit. <laughs> first, first um, I just wanted to say that we're really happy to hear that you're Response by the ravens, you know, oh, validates ownership by the chickenady of this of this uh, story, and I think it's just so wonderful to be able to hear it from a chickenady and to see you know, the visual representation of that encounter between the uh, supernatural being, the octopus, devil club, and a chickenady person who gave his life for the ownership of that, of your crest. And uh, although I am an eagle, I, I want to read, I want to sing a Chippenady song that was, you know, composed by a father for his son, a Chippenady Yeti, the oh. child of the Chippenady. And I just want to sing it in honor of, of Tom, Johnny Marks. And I don't know if my son or any of my grandchildren are here to join me singing the song. It's a Japanese song. Oh, okay. We're proud, you know, that we were allowed to sing the song um, by, by giving permission by John Marks. And it was composed for him. Oh, uh -huh. I appreciate that, yeah.
okay. It's like any good thing that happens and comes on, there's always got to be an ending, right? And so, well, we're going to, is there any true Canadian in the house? If there are, you're more than welcome to come and join us as we exit off. My granddaughter here, she's going to drum or sing in our family. My great granddaughters, do you want to come and follow? You're more than welcome. Uh, nothing like great granddaughters, huh? Okay. I think that. it's good to have artists talk like this, so yeah, we need to do more of it. I do.